Okay, so we're going to be starting in about 30 seconds here. So I just want to make sure everybody is in the right theater because I expected to have about 10 people here. So this is the Smarten Up Your Home presentation. And I'm going to wait till 9.15 because I have an hour presentation and I want to make sure I fit it in right in that window. They are the future. Lead them and let them. Oh, I screwed it up. Never mind. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, this is a presentation about home automation called Smart Up Your Home. It was originally entitled, You Too Can Have a Smart Home and Not Have it to Take Out a Second Mortgage, but apparently that was too long of a title. My name is Matthew Bach. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter to hear stuff about reality TV shows, my Twitter handle is at MJBach. So to get started, just a little bit about myself so you understand, frame of reference, where I'm coming from. I'm an Aries. I like long walks on the beach. I am a PM slash BA. I am not a developer. Um, I do know how to write code. Anybody that's worked on a project with me will know that eventually we'll have a task in a sprint and I'll say, this is so simple, even I can do it. And at that point they'll say, well then go ahead and do it. I did that once and I ended up breaking the build. That was the last time I tried to write code in the last 10 years. I am a two-time most eligible bachelor in Columbus. My wife wants me to stop submitting myself for that. <laughs> and most importantly for the point of this topic is I'm a fiddler. And when I say fiddler, it doesn't mean that I play a fiddle. I have no musical acumen. It means that I like to dabble in different electronics products. So when it comes to fiddling, who can tell me the average number of internet connected devices that a household in the US has? Anybody have a guess? 10, Ten? it's close, it's seven. Okay, anybody wanna take a guess how many internet connected devices I have in my house? It's closer to 100 than it is to 7. A lot closer to 100. So just to give you a frame of reference, I do not have an Apple household, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but I have more than seven iOS devices in my house because I have a wife and kids. So just to kind of give you kind of a precursor, who here remembers when digital picture frames first came out? Who remembers how expensive digital picture frames were when they first came out? You get a digital picture frame about a three and a half inch screen and it costs like $150. And I wanted to get my wife something nice for our anniversary, but I didn't want to spend any of her money on it. So what I did was I, I built a $30 LCD picture frame. And how I did that is I took a PlayStation 1 portable screen, an SD card reader with an SD out, and I cobbled it together in a box under 30 bucks. And that's how I approached the home automation. With smart homes, it's not so much what it's designed to do, it's what you can figure out how to make it do. So what exactly is a smart home? And this is the part where I need to use the other mouse. And I have no audio, but this is from Back to the Future 2. <laughs> and she puts her, there we go. Take it easy and you'll be fine. And be careful in the future. Future? The future! Which in this case is actually a little bit over five months from now because this scene takes place in October of 2015. <laughs> but a smart home, there's many different components that can make up a smart home. Not the least of which is lights. So that's the most obvious one. Then you have fans. Fans are a little bit more difficult because the only thing you really can do with most controllers right now is turn them on or off. You can't reverse them. You can't change speeds. Doors and windows. For doors, it's mostly either is the door open, is the door closed, and the ability to lock a door. With windows, what you actually can do is you can set up a sensor that determines how much light is in a given room, and if it's too bright, it'll automatically close your shades. I don't have that set up, but it is possible to do. Sensors, I'll get into sensors a lot later. HVAC, um, who, who can tell me what the most popular home automation HVAC component is right now? Nest, exactly. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the Nest, but along with the Nest, all, there's other devices, including humidifiers, that you can all set up to run based on commands with home automation. Home security. Home security includes both alarms and cameras. Audio visual. This is where it gets a little bit more complicated. You can actually integrate your TiVos, your DVRs, your, your VCRs, if this was taking place 10 years ago, your projectors, your TVs. Watering systems. For those of you who are lucky enough to actually have a watering system, you can set them up to run on schedules. You can also have them set up based on what the weather is going to be. Intercoms. Now, about four years ago, I think it was about four years ago, BlackBerry introduced the BlackBerry Playbook, which was their attempt at the iPod, or iPod, iPad killer. It bombed miserably. Um, I have six of these in my house. They are used only as a video intercom system. It's not necessarily what it was designed to do, but it works great. But the most important thing is you can use a smart home or design a smart home to basically do whatever you want. The only limitations you have are what you can think of and your budget. So why would somebody want to do this? Why would I want to actually go down the road and create my home into a smart home? Well, why is the garage door my problem? How many people here are married? How many people have went to bed about 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, whatever time you, you go to bed, and your spouse says, is the garage door closed? Garage door is downstairs. I'm not going downstairs. I'm just pulling it up so I can see, yes, the garage door is actually closed. Another reason is this is my dog. Well, one of my dogs. This is Joey, full name, Joseph Gordon Puppy. About a year and a half ago, my wife called me at work and when he was a puppy and she said, where's the dog? What do you mean, where's the dog? He's in his cage, isn't he? No, he's not. Oh, shoot. Let me go back. So I pulled up the footage of him at home and he was indeed not in his cage, but as you can see, there is a level up here, and a lot of times he would climb up there. So I started reviewing the footage to see if I could actually figure out where my dog had gone. And as you'll see in a second, he doesn't go much of anywhere. <laughs> and I actually had to cut some of this because he sits there for about three minutes. <laughs> but eventually, even though he is a little bit overweight, even more so now, he does get out and he makes an appearance on camera as he walks out. <laughs> but since I had this system, I was able to know not only where he was, but when he got out and how much time I had to get home before he created a mess. Just like the garage door, another common question is, is the front door locked? Once again, I can just look at the dashboard of my system and it'll tell me, in this case, my front door is indeed locked because that is the locked door symbol. And if it wasn't locked, I could lock it from this interface. But lastly, the reason I did it is because it's cool. Um, for a lot of you, you might not know, this is Arthur Fonzarelli, the Fonz from a show in the 80s called Happy Days. So let's go over a few home automation basics. First thing I want to talk about is protocols. First protocol I want to talk about is X10. I don't know how many of you remember X10, but in the mid-90s, X10 started releasing home automation products. Their most common one was small wireless video transmitters. If you ever went to their website, you probably have malware on your computer because it was terrible. But they were kind of the first person, or the first group to get into home automation in the consumer space. The most important one, and the one I'm going to spend the most time talking about today, is Z-Wave. Uh, Z-Wave is a standard that is monitored by what's called the Z-Wave Alliance. Pretty much any home automation system you have can control Z-Wave enabled devices. In order for a device to be labeled Z-Wave, it has to pass testing, which means it adheres to standards. Now, since most of you are developers, you know if there's a standard like HTML, that means it works the same everywhere, right? It's going to work the same in Firefox, it's going to work the same in Chrome. It's the same way with Z-Wave. Technically, if it's Z-Wave enabled, it's supposed to work the same for every, every different system, but it doesn't always. 
Insteon is kind of a newer up and coming one. It's the second most common next to Z-Wave. Um, it doesn't have a label necessarily that you will see, but it is a very common protocol. Zigbee is one that is used primarily by one specific company. It actually comes out of a different set of automation that had nothing to do with home automation, but you will see some Zigbee enabled products. So then components, there's a couple different types of components you need to understand. The first is the controller. The controller is the brain of the system, whether it's a standalone box, whether it's a PC, whether it's a USB stick connected to a PC, this is how you control your devices. Then you have what are called actuators. Actuators mostly are switches. They are the things that you can control. The control changes the state of an actuator. Sensors, sensors, pretty straightforward. They sense things. They tell you the status of something. And then interfaces. Interfaces are the way that you control different things. Okay, since I'm gonna be talking mostly about Z-Wave enabled products, I have to explain what a mesh network is. Um, basically, when you add a device, a Z-Wave device to a system, it is added to what's called the mesh network. Now, how does that work? I'm sure most of you have probably been to a football game or a baseball game. You go to like a Browns game or a Bengals game. Uh, it wouldn't apply to Ohio State, but you see the beer guy walking up the aisle. Beer here. And you're like, you want a beer? Heck yeah, you want a beer. But you're in the middle of the aisle. You cannot get to the beer guy. The beer guy cannot get to you because there are 15 people between you and the beer guy. So how do you get your beer? You take your dollar or $10 and you pass it to the next guy. They pass it to the next guy. They pass it to the next guy. And then the beer goes down that way. That's how, kind of how a mesh network works. Imagine you have your controller here and you have a device here. Your controller cannot see your device because your device is too far away. However, if your device is or your controller is here, you have a device here, a device here, a device here, and a device here. Now, this device contacts this device, which contacts this device, which sends it back to the system. It basically creates a mesh so that every part is interconnected and it knows I can't see this directly. I'm going to send it down this path to get back to the controller. So we want to think about how we're going to approach this. Large or small, no matter if you're going to do two lights in your entire home or you're going to do your entire house, you want to have a plan. You want to lay out exactly it is, what it is you want to do. And you don't want to think about today or tomorrow. You want to think about your goal state. Your goal state might not happen for five years from now, but you want to make sure that every step you're doing between now and when you reach goal state, and let's be honest, you're never gonna reach goal state because you're always gonna be adapting your system. But you wanna make sure that you are not locking yourself into a box where you cannot expand to what you want your system to do. You wanna think about who this is for. Who's gonna be using this? And not just who's gonna be using this actively, but also who's gonna be using this passively. Is it gonna be just you? Is it gonna be your spouse? Is it gonna be your kids? What is their technical ability? Are they able to understand different things? I ran through my slide deck last night with my wife and went through this whole thing. And she said, is this really how this stuff works? And yeah, it is. But she doesn't need to know that. She just needs to know, I press this button, this happens. Research. I cannot stress enough how important it is to actually research what you're doing. If you don't research what you're doing, you're going to end up doing a lot of rework, which is going to end up adding a lot of additional cost budget. Now, my original title was about how you can smarten up your home without having to take out a second mortgage, but there's no way around it. Home automation is expensive. Um, everything you do is going to cost you money. If you look at a light switch, you go to Lowe's and you buy like a regular light switch, you can get one for under $2. To buy a light switch that is network compatible, they start at about $40 or $50. So there is a cost associated to it and you need to plan for that. So you want to know how you want to approach it. And there's two different fields of thought here. There's the Apple way and the Android way, which, by the way, have absolutely nothing to do with Apple and Android, except for it's the way of thinking. With Apple, you get a very, very polished product. 
you get something that works great. The iPad is great. The iPhone is great. The iWatch, eh, we'll see. But with Android, you might not get as much of a finished polished, sol polished solution, but it gives you a lot more flexibility with what you want to do and how you do it. So here are some different controller options. Control 4 is by far, without a doubt, the best solution out there. There is no doubt, if you go into someone's house who has a Control 4 setup, it's amazing. I don't suggest it for two reasons. It is prohibitively expensive. Um, and it's also completely out of your hands. You cannot add new devices to it. You cannot change anything. Everything has to be done by an outside group. The Philips Hue is probably the cheapest way to get into it. Uh, Philips Hue is basically based on light bulbs for the most part. It's light bulbs and an app on your phone. Very simple, not very flexible, but very cheap, relatively. The Lowe's Wink Hub and the rest of the ones listed here, the Belkin Wemo, the Staples Connect, Logitech Harmony Home Hub, Insean Hub, and the Lutron Caseta are all very similar, but I want to point out special attention to the Wink Hub, just because if you go into Lowe's, they have a whole section dedicated to the Wink Hub, and you will see the different switches and sensors and things that are set up there, and they are labeled works with Wink or designed for Wink. That does not mean that they won't work with other systems, but they might not. Anyone that is Z-Wave enabled is required to have the Z-Wave label on it, so even though it says works with Wink, but if it has that Z-Wave label on it, it will work with any other system. If it does not have that, it may, it may not. And the only way to, to find out is either to buy it and try it or to actually do research on it. So which one should you choose? It's really a personal preference. What is the best solution for you? What works with what you want to end up doing? For me, it was none of the ones that I've listed so far because all of the ones I've listed so far are pretty much closed systems. They don't have a lot of flexibility. They don't have a lot of ability to do things how you want to do them. I went with what's called the Mikasa Verde, Verde Vera. And there are three different Veras. There's the original one, which is the Vera Lite. Then there's the Vera 3. I do not know what happened to the Vera 2. <laughs> and about six months ago, they released the Vera Edge. Each of them, as you go down the list, is increasing in power and increasing in capability. I have the Vera 3. If you do want to go into this particular area, I strongly suggest against getting the Vera Edge. Because it is a new product, right now it is very unstable and a lot of stuff does not work correctly with it. They're trying to work out some firmware issues, but six months down the road, it still is not a great solution for what you want to do, in my opinion. So my setup, to let you know what I have in my house, I have a controller Vera 3, I already mentioned that. For actuators, I have 20 switches, which includes in, in the wall regular light switches and actual outlets. I have four dimmer switches. I have one door lock. I have six sensors, which I'll get into a little bit later. For interfaces, tablets. PC, phone, and I also have a wall-mounted touchscreen, which is actually just a giant tablet, but it's a 20-inch one, and I use it as a control center in my basement. For miscellaneous items, which are also tied in to my home automation, I have a 16-channel home, home security DVR. Connected to that DVR are 18 cameras, which 16 analog, two IP. I have four, four input, analog to IP converters so that I can actually take all of my analog cameras and connect them directly to my Vera. I have six URC, which is universal remote control, RF remote controls, three IR repeaters so that it takes that RF signal and it translates it into an RF signal. I mean, it takes that RF signal and translates it into an IR signal in different parts of the house. A Raspberry Pi, which is a key to one of the most important things I do, and apps. There's tons of different apps. One of the things I really like about the Vera is that there are apps for every single platform, every single device, but some that draw special attention is Tasker. Any of you who have an Android device, I strongly suggest getting Tasker. Even if you don't get it for home automation, Tasker is a great program 
that you can set it up to basically kick off anything at any time for any reason that you want. Geofencing, no matter what you want to do, it's a great application. And Parahome is the other really important one on the Android side. And there's tons of others, some of which I'll touch on a little bit. So wiring basics for actuators. This is just tied to when you're actually dealing with 120 volts. You need to have a neutral wire. The neutral wire is almost always the white wire. If you do not know what a neutral wire is, hire an electrician. <laughs> or find someone who does know what a neutral wire is. Almost none of this stuff will work without a neutral wire. Any house that was built in the last 15 years should have neutral wires in almost every box, but it'll be the white wire 90% of the time. CFL bulbs, which have kind of fallen out of favor but were hot for a little bit, will not work with any dimmers. Um, some of them will not work at all with any switched lights. LED bulbs may or may not work. They'll be labeled if they do. Even if they're labeled that they do, they may not. Once again, that's something where you should do your due diligence and do your research. So we're ready to get started and we're ready to actually start pushing down the home automation path. So you want to create a project plan. Now maybe it's the PM in me, but, or maybe it's the fact that I didn't do this when I first started. But having a project plan that lays out from the first step to the last step everything you want to do is very, very beneficial. And you want to have spreadsheets of everything that you're going to put in, what rooms are going to go in, what you're going to call them, what numbers they are. If you don't have this information, you will eventually have to figure it out. And it's easier to figure out before you have something in a wall. Set a budget. I mentioned already that no matter what, it is going to be something that's expensive. But if you set your budget, it gives you an idea of what you can do and how you can set your timeline. If you're like me and you're married, you have a very limited budget with what you can do. If you're not married, you can basically do whatever you want probably. <laughs> so you wanna buy your equipment, but you wanna start small. Um, a habit a lot of people, myself included, is when you start working on something, you jump in and you're all in. I wanna do 40 outlets in my house. I go out and I buy my controller and I go out and I buy 40 outlets. I install the first two outlets. And I figure, yeah, I'm really not going to do the rest of these. Now I have 38 outlets that cost 40, 50 bucks a piece that I have nothing to do with. You need to choose how you want to do it. Do you want to do it internal, external, or both? What I mean by internal versus external is, do you want it to be in the wall? Do you want it to be something you plug into an outlet? Or do you want to use kind of a combination of both? You want to build a test strip. This is one of my two test rigs that I have. This is a test rig actually for a three-way switch and you can actually see this is a Z-Wave device right here. And I'll explain why you want to have a test rig, but if you test your equipment before you install it, it's a lot easier than if you install it and it doesn't work and you try to figure out why. Test before you deploy. You guys should know that. Uh, I've worked with some of you, I know some of you don't, but it's something you should know. Test before you deploy. And be prepared to fail. Um, just like with any development project, with any project you work on, there are going to be road bumps. Road bumps. There's going to be bumps in the road. There's going to be hiccups. There's going to be things that aren't going to go the way that you expect it. Especially when you're venturing into something that you're, you don't have a good feel for, you're not really comfortable with, you're going to have issues. So you have to be prepared for those failures and not give up. Okay, so now we're actually going to get started. The first thing you need to do is you can need to configure your base station. For pretty much every company, that includes creating an account with whoever it is. In my case, I had to go to Mi Casa Verde and create my home account. Some of these systems require monthly fees. Some of them do not, but almost all of them require you to create an account on their system. Run your first test with an external device. And what I mean by that is you have, these are three different external devices. The first one is a exterior switch. It's meant to actually sit outside. I use it for my Christmas tree that sits on my front porch. The second one is just a plug-in, and the third one is an actual screw-in. A regular light bulb would go on top of that. The reason you want to test, run a test with an external first is because it'll, you'll know that your system actually works. And you want to make sure that your system works before you actually start going hog wild into it. So when you get your first device, in this case, it should be an external device. You want to go in and you need to pair the device to your controller. 
Just like when you pair a Bluetooth headset to your phone, what it does is it says, hey, we have a relationship here. I can control this. The way that you do it in the system I use is you go, it's real simple. You go to devices, add device, and then add, and it will scan for anything that is currently in pairing mode, and it will find it. After you pair the device, you want to name the device something meaningful. You want to have that whatever it is, even if it's just a test switch, call it test switch for basement. You want to give it a name so that you know exactly which one it is, especially if you have several of them. Then you want to test the device. Before you do anything else, you have one device, you've paired one device. If it doesn't work, it's a lot easier to troubleshoot because you only have minimal points of failure. I broke my own rule here because I label this on off switch. But it's real simple to test it. All you do is you click on on, turns on, click on off, it turns off. If that works, then you're ready to move forward. But you want to retest the device, then you want to retest the device again. Make sure that you can consistently get it to do what you want it to do. So now we're actually ready to start adding more things to our system. Once again, you want to plan your attack. How are you going to do this? Try to be logical about it. Are you going to do everything in your basement first? Are you going to do everything in the master bedroom first? Try to have a logical workflow with how are you going to do it. Don't say, well, I'm going to do this outlet in the living room. I'm going to do this light switch in the family room. And I'm going to do something in the garage. It's a lot easier if you're working in one concentrated area. So make sure you plan your attack. Do one item at a time. This is going to be one of the things that if any of you guys do this, that everyone will break this rule. If you are doing, for example, your living room and you have two light switches and an outlet you want to do, you're going to be tempted to cut the power and do all three of them. Don't do that. Because if you do and it doesn't work, and it probably won't, you're not going to be able to figure out where your point of failure is, and it's going to cost you a lot of time redoing things. Make a switch to outlet breaker map. What I mean by that is you probably have 20, 30 different breakers in your basement, and you have 50 different lights and outlets, whatever. You want to know the outlets that you're going to work with or the light switches you're going to work with are assigned to which breaker. You'd think that, OK, I'm in the living room. All of these are going to be on the same breaker. I'm in my kitchen. All these are going to be on the same breaker. It doesn't always work that way. In my house, I have one outlet in my living room, in my kitchen, and in my family room that are on the same breaker. I have light switches in the same rooms on completely different breakers. It makes no sense. But that's why you want to make a map of how it actually works. You want to test out of the wall. And that's where the test rig comes into place. What you want to do is you want to take your test rig and place it as close to where it's actually going to go and test there. When I initially started doing this, I had created a test rig and I paired everything in my basement down where my controller was. And then when I went and I installed them up in the wall, they didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is because of that mesh network. The mesh network remembers what every device's neighbor is. And since I set it up here and then I installed it here, it was expecting different devices to be able to communicate and it couldn't find the controller. Pairing the device, it's the same as before. Test the device. Make sure you test it. Then you want to cut the power. We always want to do things as quickly as possible. One of the most tempting things, because your breaker is usually in the basement and the things you're working on are usually on the first floor or the second floor, is, eh, I don't need to cut the power. I can do this with it. Trust me, it hurts a lot. <laughs> you want to make sure you cut the power. You want to label the device on the device. What I mean by that is when you pair a device to your controller, it will give it a system ID number. It usually starts at one and then it goes up by individual numbers. Take a permanent marker right on the back of it. This is device three. This is device six. The reason for that is you might find, find out, okay, well, device six doesn't appear to be working. I don't remember which one is device six. So that's why I want to make sure you label them and also put them in a spreadsheet. You want to test the power, make sure the power is off. And now you want to wire the device to where it's going to go. You don't want to put it in the wall yet. You want to have it hang out of the wall and wire it. Then you want to reconnect the power. And you want to test it locally. What I mean by test local is if you are doing a light switch, your regular light switch should still work. 
Then you also want to test remote. You want to take your tablet or your computer or whatever, and you want to test your home automation. Can I, via computer, turn the switch on and off? Those work, cut the power. Now you want to install it in the wall, reconnect the power, test it local, test it remote, wash, rinse, repeat. These are all repeatable steps. You will get into a pattern if you do this enough where you think I can start cutting steps, I can start doing multiple things at the same time. I strongly suggest against doing that because it makes it a lot harder when you run into a problem. So sensors, what can a sensor sense? And what is the point of a sensor? Open and closed is the most common type of sensor. This is actually, and you probably can't see this, but this is actually a, a door sensor, a door window sensor. It's just basically a magnet. Magnet here, and then it's a contact switch that closes when you put it together. That test basically, are these two things together? Is it closed? Temperature. Temperature is something that can be sensed and it can be used for multiple things. I've seen instances where someone actually had it where if the temperature was over 80 degrees and the sun was out, they automatically closed their blinds so that the heat, the house didn't heat up as much. Humidity, um, sensors can test humidity. I really don't know why, but they can. Light, light levels. Once again, for opening, closing shades, something that is testable or sensible. Great thing about sensors is they are self-powered. There is a, most sensors, are, there are some that are actually hard, hardwired, but this actually has a AA battery in it. Double A battery will last about 18 months. And it will actually, on your system, it will tell you the battery level of your sensor and it'll tell you when you actually need to change it. You wanna add any sensors at the location. Just like you took your test rig and took it to the location where you wanna install it, you wanna install your sensor, pair the sensor to the system wherever it is actually going to reside because just like everything else, it uses that mesh network and if you pair it here, install it here, it doesn't know where it is and it might not be able to communicate with the controller. And test it. You know, I can't stress enough how much testing stuff before you finally install something is important. Now, why did I pick the Vera over the other solutions? Who here can tell me who Gene Krantz is? Anybody? Who's Gene Krantz? He's a flight director. He's a flight director at NASA during the Apollo and Gemini missions. Who can tell me what this is? Come on, you're developers, I'm sure you all know. <laughs> this is Viagra. Now what do these two things have in common? Go to the next slide. Gene, I'm wondering what the, what the Gremlin guys think about this. We can't make any guarantees. We designed the limb to land on the moon. Not fire the engine out there for course correction. Well, Unfortunately, we're not landing on the moon. No. I don't care what anything was designed to do. I care about what it can do. So let's get to work. Let's lay it out. Okay? And that's why I picked the Vero. It's not so much what it's designed to do, not what home automation is designed to do, it's what it can do. There's actually a custom coding engine included within the Vero. You can write your own code to write custom scripts. Um, and just as kind of a side note, why Viagra was brought up, brought up, who can tell me why Viagra was developed? Cure for baldness. Which is ironic given what it actually does. <laughs> so why the Vera? It has a publicly available SDK. And because of that, there is a great developer community. People like yourselves. Um, the Nest was brought up earlier. The Nest was one of the first and is definitely currently the most popular um, HVAC controller that can be controlled either by a smart home or, or via Wi-Fi. It is not designed to work with the Vera. Within a month of the Vera, or the Vera, the Nest being released, there was a plug-in for the Vera and the Vera now works perfectly with, I can't remember which one I said, they work together. And even though it was not designed to work with it, Plug-in support, I mentioned the Nest, TiVo, smart TVs, IP cams. IP cams is an important one because of all of the controllers I listed, all of them have IP cam compatibility, but they are only compatible with their own IP cams. For example, if you buy a Wink, you need to buy an IP cam that is designed for Wink. No other IP cams will work for it. 
With Devira, they actually have plugins for all different types, including just generic IP cam, and it allows you to control an IP camera with Devira. Weather Underground, uh, Weather Underground is a, it's a website, and it, it basically has all of the temperature readings for every weather station in the country. When you see on the news, and it's 55 degrees in Hilliard today, that is reported from the weather station. That is actually data that's available online via subscription. With a plugin, you can actually have your Vera tell you what the high, the low, the current, and forecast is for every day, and you can have your thermostat, Nest for example, actually change based on those parameters. Apps on all platforms, even BlackBerry. BlackBerry is not supported by any other home automation controller that I know of. Okay, the Vera structure, uh, as we move forward, it's a little bit important to understand how the Vera structure works. Devices, devices are your switches. Then you have rooms. Rooms are basically logical groupings. They don't actually have to be rooms, but that's the way I use them. So you create a room called living room, and then you have all of your devices in your living room reside in your living room. It's a great way to group things together, especially as your system grows and you have more and more items in it. You have a dashboard. Your dashboard is basically like your home page for the system. You can create favorites. It's actually called pinning it to the dashboard. And if you know that you have 50 devices in your house, but you really are only gonna use six of them with any kind of consistency, you pin those six to the dashboard. When you log into the website, it'll take you directly to the dashboard, and those six will be the one that, ones that you see. Scenes, scenes are ways to do different things. For example, if you wanted to, if you wanted to watch a movie, you could walk, create a scene called movie, and that movie says, turn this light off, turn this light down to 20%, turn on the projector, press play on your Blu-ray player. That would be a scene. Triggers, triggers are things that can set off notifications. Trigger, a trigger can be something as simple as a motion detector is set off, or this light is turned on between this hour and this hour. Schedule. Every system has the ability to schedule. A schedule is, I want this light to turn on at seven o'clock. So let's look at a few ways to smarten up a home that I've actually done in real life. Okay, this part's called keys are too complicated. This is my 12 year old son. Uh, he's in sixth grade, and this is the first year that he's not part of latch key, so he gets on the bus in the morning, he comes home on the bus in the afternoon, he comes home by himself. During the summer before this school year, my wife said, I want to get a lock for the front door that has a keypad so he can get in. Can't we just give him a key? <laughs> well, that's a little bit too much responsibility. Granted, this is the kid we just bought a brand new iPhone for, but he can't handle a 79 cent key. <laughs> so I bought an automated lock and I had a choice. I could either buy an automated lock that was just the pin pad or I could buy an automated lock that actually integrated into my system. I spent the extra money so they could integrate into my system because the next question, which I knew was coming, was, can you tell me when he gets home? Yeah, you can. Because opening that door lock with his code is a trigger which sends a notification. So when he puts in his PIN code, it sends a text to both my wife and myself. So pretty much every day, I get a text that says, you know, Dylan has unlocked his door. And then I get another one five minutes later because he went out and got the mail. And the great thing about this is you can actually assign individual pin codes to different people. So my pin code is different than his. So when I use the, to get in the front door, nothing happens. And if you have a cleaning lady, you can set it up for a cleaning lady and you can have it set up so that it only works during the time that she's supposed to be there. If she's there every Tuesday, the cleaning lady's pin code will only work on Tuesday between 8 and 4 p.m., 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. This is my wife, which I know you probably will find hard to believe based on how I look. But we have a difference in our temperature preference. She likes to live in what I'd like to call an Arctic temperature, but still sleeps underneath all the covers. And this causes a sleep problem, because I cannot sleep when it's that cold. She can't sleep when it's, that, when it's warm and the fan is not on. So, and we're on different schedules too. And I thought about it, you know what? Us being on different schedules, that's actually the solution. 
There is no control set up in my home that turns on a fan. But you can believe there are a bunch of them that turn them off. So she goes up to bed at night, she turns on the fan. Every morning at 2.15, the fan turns off. And then she gets up at 2.30 and turns it back on. But that's a complete another story. Okay, you've got mail. Um, now I'm older than a lot of the people here, but I remember back when I was younger, you used to collect cereal top boxes. And you'd send in cereal top boxes and you'd get like an 18 van in the mail. And you'd send it in and then you'd wait every day. Even though it said six to eight weeks, every day you'd be sitting there and you'd run out to the mailbox, is it here yet? Is it here yet? And eventually you'd get the 18 van and it wasn't that good. But still, as I've gotten older, I'm still waiting for the mail. But the things that come in the mail are now cooler. <laughs> so what I did was I took one of these sensors, a sensor just like this one, and I put it out in my mailbox. And you'd say, well, your mailbox, at least in my case, is not on your house. It's actually down at the end of your driveway. Will it work? I wasn't sure if it did. Fortunately, I have enough devices in my home that, yes, it did recognize that it worked. So the range wasn't a problem. So when someone goes and opens the mailbox, it opens the sensor, and I get a text message that says that I have mail. Who can tell me what the problem with that scenario is? There's... Okay, that's one. That's not the one I'm looking for. <laughs> that's another one. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what the problem is. <laughs> the problem is, is that there's actually a couple of them. If I have to mail something and I go out and I put something in the mailbox in the morning, I don't want to get a text message. After the mails come, I go out and I get the mail. I don't want to get another text message. So what I did was I created custom code with a timer that sensor only sends a notification if the mailbox is open between 11 and 2 o'clock, because that's when the mail comes, somewhere in that range. And if that mailbox has been open between 11 and 2, it resets the timer till the next day so that it doesn't matter. After it's been opened once, you can open it a million times. It's not going to send any additional text messages. So now I want to take it to another level, and these are some things I actually had to have video to explain exactly how they work. And that is actually a different pullover. It's, it's just fair. <laughs> so I get home from taking a walk and I want to open up my garage door, but I can't remember the code. Real simple, all I gotta do is take my phone, press it up against it, and it opens, just like magic. So here I am in my basement and I said I want to watch a movie. It's real simple. Run movie. And you can see it's actually a projector. It's a real projector that's hidden in the wall. That's it. So here I'm in bed and I'm about to watch some TV, but the light is on and the fan is off, which I need to be the exact opposite. Problem is, the switches are way over there, and that's just too far to go. So all I have to do is I just take the remote control, turn the fan on, and turn the lights off, and now I can watch TV. Okay. So I'm going to walk through how I did all of those to show you some of the examples of how you can actually customize your system. So the garage door, when I, the, when I originally started working on the garage door, it came out because I'm very absent-minded. And sometimes I'll, did I shut the garage door? Did I not shut the garage door? So I'd get to work and I'd pull up the camera and the garage door was open. So I'd call my neighbor and I'd have to have my neighbor come over and do it. So I already had this home automation set up. So can I have a way that I can remotely close my garage door or open my garage door if needed? However, no product at that time existed. Now there are a couple that exist, but this was a couple years ago. So I decided, why don't I just make one? Why don't I figure out how it actually works and just make one myself. So what I did was I took an external switch, a garage door opener, and a project box, and I cobbled this together. Now, almost every one of you has a car. Most cars today have the garage door opener built into the car itself. So almost all of you probably have at least one garage door opener remote that's sitting in a drawer somewhere unused. I had a bunch of them, I used one of them, and I took it apart, and all I did is I found out the pins that connect 
to actually close the circuit to cause the garage door opener to tell the garage to open. And I took a relay and I made it so when I turn on, I thought I brought one, but I didn't. When I turn on that external switch, it closes the relay, which shorts those two pins together, which causes the garage door to actually open. There is a significant problem with this setup. Does anybody, I'm, I don't know if I should ask again, but can anybody tell me what the problem with this is? Nope, not range. Nope. When you turn it on, it closes the relay, so you're holding down that button it will continue to hold down that button until you tell that switch to turn off. And it'll burn out the remote or at least eat through the battery. So what I did is I created a scene with custom code. And if you look at it, you can kind of see here, all it does is local device is 16, which means that's that switch. And tells it blah, 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 blah. After a delay of two seconds, switch off. So it is a scene, turn it on. The switch turns on, the relay closes, the garage door button is closed, the garage door starts to open or close. Two seconds later, it shuts the power off, which causes the relay to open, which causes the switch to no longer be pushed down, and it works. So that's how the original part worked. But the part with the actual other part is done with an NFC tag. I took an NFC tag and I programmed it to execute a task. When my phone is placed up against that NFC tag, it says, hey, run this task, which I created with Tasker. Tasker triggers a scene, in this case, that garage door scene. This is not possible to do on an iDevice. Um, it's not possible for two reasons. Number one, there is not an app that is the equivalent of Tasker available in the Apple Store. And number two, even though Apple finally did release devices with NFC on them, it's crippled and it's only able to be used for Apple Pay. That will change in the future, but as of right now, it's not possible to do with an iDevice. And just like everything else, that trigger sends a text to my phone, hey, this has been done. RF remote control. I was doing a search on Xbox One, nothing related to home automation at all. And I saw that someone was able to actually control their Vera with an Xbox One, which I thought, this is really, really cool. What, how it's done is it's done via an HTTP command, which is this command here, IP address, run this scene. So what I did was I took an old PC I had lying around, an XP machine. I loaded a program called Event Ghost on it. Event Ghost is something that if you do a keystroke, it will trigger something to happen. I found an IR keyboard, not an RF keyboard, an IR keyboard, which are much harder to find. And I used an IR repeater to basically set it up in front of the computer so that no matter where the remote was originally, it would send it to the computer. And then I had to program custom RF IR remotes. It took an IR signal, changed it to RF, send it to the RF repeater, which changed it back to IR. IR goes to the computer, computer sends the code. And I created custom designs for the remote control. This is actually my family room. And you can see you have the overhead lights, the lamp, and in this case, the Christmas tree, because there's one outlet that we put the Christmas tree on, and you can turn any of these on or off. In the pool room, you have the ability to turn the overhead light or the actual pool table lights on. But it seemed kind of wasteful to have a computer on 24-7. So I looked for, is there another solution? Is there a CAN solution that was possible? And I did find one from the UK. It's called the Keen IR Anywhere. However, there were two limitations with it. Number one was the cost. It cost 89 pounds plus 40 pound shipping plus something value add tax. So roughly worked out to be about 130 pounds, which translated to US dollars is about 1,000, I think. I'm not sure. So that wasn't really a good solution. And it also had limited codes. It only had the ability to store 20 different things, which might seem like a lot, but as your system grows, like I said, don't think about today, don't think about tomorrow, think about your goal state. So how can I come up with a do-it-yourself solution? I bought a Raspberry Pi, which looks like that. And then I had to figure out how to get the Pi to send HTTP requests. I loaded the Pi with software, and then I guessed, I did research, and I asked questions online. I got two responses from people online, and they were either, I don't know, 
or it can't be done, which I found incredibly hard to believe. So I just guessed and guessed and I asked people at work and finally I figured out that curl was the key. The curl command actually allows you to send an HTTP request. So I added a, a PI IR receiver to the logic pins. Then I loaded Lurk, which is the infrared code set. I had to learn all the codes. I actually had to program each of the individual codes. And then I had to create the scenes in Vera. Then I had to link the IR code to the scene in Vera. And that's how that all works. But it's, it's a great system in that no matter what room you're in, you have a remote and you can turn off the lights and or the fan in any room you're in. And if you want to mess with your kids and they're downstairs, you can turn off the lights when they're downstairs as well. So watching a movie, the watching a movie one is actually very simple. Um, there's an app, it's called Automation HD. That combined with Google Voice and a custom scene to change the light levels and turn on the projector and plus, press play on the Blu-ray. Also tied into a Raspberry Pi, also using Lurk. The only difference is instead of using an IR receiver, it uses an IR transmitter. So what went wrong? And I don't mean what went wrong in general because I don't have enough time. I mean, what went wrong with all the stuff I've worked on, with all the home automation stuff I've worked on? What pitfalls have I had? A lot of it's trial and error. Um, there's some documentation, there's good forums, but a lot of it is just trying it. Does this work, does this not work? You need to be able to deal with that failure. You need to be able to say, I'm gonna try this, it doesn't work, I'm gonna try this. You need to have patience with it. Um, switches not working. I've had switches not work after I installed them in a wall. It's because the switch was bad. That's how I learned. Make sure you test it outside of the wall before you install it. I've had switches blow up, but that was because I hooked the power to the wrong thing, so that was my fault. Where are you device 32? This is where I said you want to make sure you label and have a spreadsheet of what device is what device number. I had device 32 was reporting an error in my system. It says this, there's a communication issue, this device does not work. I did not know what that device was. And as you get up to 20, 30, 40 things, it's much, much harder to find device 32. Raspberry Pi voice control. I tried for several days to get Raspberry Pi to work with a PS3 camera with saying, computer, turn lights on. I got it to work, but I had a success ratio of about 5%. That works better than my system does. <laughs> so I had about a 5% success ratio, which meant for every 20 times I told it to turn the lights on, it turned on once. So I abandoned that project. Shocking events, forgetting to turn the power off or refusing to turn the power off. Reach in, oh, this wire is hot. Garage door flakiness, um, the battery died in my garage door remote, which caused it not to work and I couldn't figure out why. What is the device number, just like device 32? If you don't know what device is which, it's very difficult to find them. And not Switzerland. I mentioned in the beginning, if it doesn't have a neutral wire in a box, it will not work. You can try a lot of different things and you'll get it to work temporarily, but as soon as you turn the switch off, it no longer has power and it will not work. So if you don't have a neutral wire, it will not work. Last thing I wanna talk about, and this is very, very brief, is what I call the game changer. There's one device that was released, I believe it was late last year, that I currently don't have them on the waiting list for, which I think is really going to change the whole home automation and smart home game. Does anybody have a guess what it is? There you go, Amazon Echo. Um, Amazon Echo is still in very short supply and they have limited, in limited amounts released the SDK to certain developers, but they're going to release the full SDK, which I think is really going to make things exciting. And there's a, just a brief example of what someone did hacking together. Alexa, kitchen on. A little bit of a delay, Alexa, but it still works. Kitchen off. I think as the SDK gets out to everybody and people like yourself start developing custom apps for it, this is going to be something that's going to be really exciting and is really going to change the future of home automation. Speaking of the future, this is my last non-question slide. Apple is going to enter this market. It's a matter of time. I honestly expected them to get into it this year. 
if it's not next year, I'm willing to bet in the next three years, Apple will have something in this space, which will definitely change how things are done. Google has its hands in it a little bit, but not a ton. I think they will also step it up probably right after Apple does. <laughs> but I think that both of these two will happen. And then the one you can't count out is Microsoft. Um, Microsoft probably three years after it's really popular and Apple has everything, Microsoft will get into the market. But I think in the next five years, Apple definitely will be in, Google will be partially in, and then Microsoft will probably trail a little bit behind that. Okay, did anybody have any questions? Yes? Won't work. Yes? Since it's using its own, um, most of the stuff I talked about is using its own Z-Wave network. It, 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 no, it's not. Yes? When I was doing the installs, the guy who was helping me with it, he said, if you move, are you taking this stuff out? I said, just like the video games in my basement, there's no way in hell I'm taking this stuff out. I'll just, I'll have it as an add-on, a value add. Oh, the back-end solution I might take with me, I'll leave the switches in there. Um, because the switches themselves work like normal light switches. It's just I'll remove the ability to actually control it. And maybe I'll just move next door and be able to control it from there. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly don't know. I know that um, some things with, with like Zigbee, um, it's not an IP thing, but there are actually devices now that have little IP um, communication chips in, them, in the light bulbs themselves. So, but I don't know the answer to your question, I'm sorry. Yes? Uh, yes. If, if you, actually this would work, um, as long as you register an account with them, you can do it locally. You won't be able to access it remotely, but as long as you have a network in your house, it would work. You don't need internet access, you just need network and network. So if you had like your own domain that was not external facing, it still would work. Okay, I got like 30 seconds left. Any last questions? All right, thank you very much for coming. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. The long one. Thanks. Great, thank you.
Hello, hello.